How does the structure transfer the load to the reaction? What happens to the structure when it transfers loads? The structure transfers loads by forces that are in the structure, and these forces cause stresses in the structural material. The structure also deforms under the effect of the loads, and the size of the deformation depends on the stiffness of the structure. To illustrate the idea of internal force, consider a simple column supporting an end load. What happens to a typical slice of the column? The slice is being squashed, or compressed, and furthermore, all slices are being squashed. The column transfers the load, to the reaction by a system of squashed slices, or to use the engineering description, the column is in compression. Not only is the column in compression, but also deforms by shortening. This happens because each slice becomes thinner on being squashed. If the direction of the load is reversed, then each slice is being stretched, and the end load is transferred to the reaction by a system of stretched slices. To use the engineering term, the column is in tension. Forces that stretch, or compress elements in the direction of their longitudinal axis are called axial forces, and these always act along the element. Looking at the load path for load P6, the walls supporting the upper beam are in compression. But what is happening to the upper and lower beams? These beams are transferring the loads to the supports by a combination of bending moments and shear forces. Although bending moments and shear forces act together, conceptually they can be considered separately. To understand what is happening to the beam, it helps to see what happens to a slice. Each side of the slice is being bent by a moment. The moments at the slice are the forces multiplied by their distances from the slice. So the moments on the slice are. This causes the slice to be squashed at the top, and stretched at the bottom. In other words, the top of the beam is in compression, and the bottom in tension, and a pair of bending moments is bending the slice. Because the top is in compression, it shortens, and because the bottom is in tension, it lengthens. These effects cause the sides to rotate. In general, the size of the bending moment varies from slice to slice. This varying size can be represented by drawing lines at right angles to the beam with the length of the line indicating the size of the bending moment. Because there is a bending moment at every slice, and the beam is made of slices, there is a bending moment at every point of the beam. A clearer picture of the bending moments on the beam, can be obtained by joining the ends of all the bending moment size lines. This diagram is called a bending moment diagram. And because each slice changes shape, the beam takes up a bent shape. Bending moments, in a beam resist the effects of the moments caused by external loads, and reactions acting at different distances from each other. Bending moments do not resist the vertical effect of loads on beams, shear forces resist these. When a rectangle is distorted by an angular change into a parallelogram, it is sheared. Returning to a slice of a beam, not only does the slice have to transfer the bending moments from one face to the other, it also has to transfer the vertical load from one face to the other. The beam either side of the slice has to be in vertical equilibrium. And the balancing forces themselves have to be balanced by forces on the face of the slice. It is these pairs of up and down forces that are called shear forces, because their effect is to shear the slice. Like bending moments, shear forces will, in general, vary along a beam. So, in a similar way to bending moment diagrams, shear force diagrams can be drawn. Thanks for watching. We hope you found some useful tips. Check out our website at structuralengineercalcs.com. Please like and subscribe, and let us know what would you like to see next. The human footprint is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. Stay safe. Goodbye, and see you soon.